Bible in this country today. That's the very reason, because that one subject right there is off the foundation. Until we get back to that foundation, we'll see no lasting changes. There'll be no churches planted because of the work of God done inside the hearts of God's people, because the repentance is not right. I just really appreciate it. I thank you, Brother Moses. And I think it's a blessing that you can teach. I knew of a couple of brothers. They were twins who traveled together. One was a teacher and one was a preacher. One of them preached about revival and the other one taught revival principles to the people. And I believe you need both of them. We need to understand what repentance is all about. Well, we greet you this evening in the name of Jesus. And I, I'd like to say it's a real blessing for me to be here and to stand in this building. I'm not quite sure about these acoustics yet, how they work out with a PA and all of that, but this, this building is a blessing. I just want to commend those of you who spent many hours and your money to make this place the way it is now. I believe that God is going to honor it. I, it feels real good here tonight, this building. Thank the Lord. Well, I'd like to speak this evening on the subject, Ten Commandments for Revival. We want to talk about revival. I don't know that that's what we're going to speak about every evening here, but that is what we're about. I believe that's what most of you have been praying for is revival. And it might be good just to draw a few guidelines about what revival is all about. And I think we'll be able to do that some as we look at this subject this evening of Ten Commandments for Revival. Ten things that God wants His people to do if they're going to have revival. Ten things that God wants His people to do if they really want to have revival. Ten things that if God's people will do it, they will see revival. Ten things. And I'd like you to listen carefully as we go down through these. God knows we need revival. God knows it, and I believe most of God's people who are truly sincere, they also know that there is a need for revival. We need a revival. Our telephones ring off the walls these days with the hearts and cries of people who are so disillusioned and they're so weary of being where they are and they're trying to find something that's real and they're, they're looking for a church where there's some Christian reality, where there's some, some real Christians, where there's some real Bible being lived out in people's lives, where people have some real joy and they're not superfluous, but they've got some foundation to them. There's something solid to them. And our telephones ring. Uh, day by day they ring with people on the telephone saying, what should I do? Where should I go? Do you have any counsel for me? What should I do? Should I move my family? Should I move to another area? What do I do? And we wonder what to tell them. But we know what the greatest answer is, that there be a revival in this land. And I'm not preaching tonight that there be a revival in America. I don't know if you could bring a revival to America in these days. But I do know that God still believes in revival in the lives of people, in their personal lives, and in the, in the corporate life of any body of believers. God still believes in revival tonight, brothers and sisters. Many needs, many tears. We catch them just this afternoon. I caught them for an hour and a half. Some family in Indiana called. He began to pour his heart out, his struggles, his burdens. What do I do? Where should I go? What about my children? And his wife was on the telephone in another room and she was just listening there quietly. And then finally I asked her a question and she began to open up her heart and share. And she just burst into tears and began to weep on the telephone over the burden that she had that, her, that, that, that they're in the wrong place and their children are being influenced wrong and her husband is being guided wrong. And she just wept on the telephone and, 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 and poured her heart out to me. That could be re-given over and over and over. I could stand up here all evening and tell you story after story like that. And there may be this evening some very cries in some hearts in this room. 
that are just like that. God knows we need revival. And we don't need to go outside this room and we don't need to go outside the doors of our churches to also acknowledge the fact there are needs among us that we don't know what to do with, aren't there, brethren? There are those among us we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we still don't see a result. God knows we need revival. Oh, for a wind of God that would blow through our congregations where we know that God has met with us of a truth, where we know that God has wrought a deep repentance in the hearts of His people. I guess I'd have to say it's a little bit hard when you got a nice revival principle like that to not go back to it, but brothers and sisters, that's the difference between a revival meeting and a revival right there. Everybody has revival meetings, don't they? You see on the signs up, revival meeting, October 19th, October 26th. Well, that's all they had too, by the way. They had a revival meeting. But God wants revival that starts on October 19th and is still going on on October 19th, a year later and two years later. And the difference is this repentance. Oh, we thank God for the mercy drops that have fallen, but oh, for a shower of God's grace upon the hearts of our, of His people. What is revival? I just should say just a little bit about what revival is. It's a quickening of God inside of us. It's, a, it's when God brings the reality of Himself back into the hearts and lives of His people, where God is real. How many testimonies have I heard coming out of the mouth of somebody who found true repentance in their life and they'll stand up the next day or two days later or a week later or a month later and say, God is real. And brothers and sisters, He is real. God is real. He's not just a name. He's not just a word. God is real. And that's what revival is all about. When God becomes real to you again, or for the first time. Ah, oh, revival, we could give many definitions. It's a clear drink from the fountain of living water. Revival is the fullness of Christ in the life of a believer. That's what revival is. <clears throat> revival is when we get a renewed vision of Calvary and a new vision of God's glory in our lives. That's what revival is. Revival is when souls start coming to Christ. That's one of the fruits of revival. Oh, how many times you hear people pray, Lord, <clears throat> if there's anything wrong in my life, Lord, reveal it to me. If there's anything wrong in my life, Lord, will you reveal it to me? Brothers and sisters, when revival comes to your life, you'll become fruitful. The one is a natural flow of the other. You will become fruitful. Are you fruitful tonight? Do you know the joy of winning a soul to Jesus Christ? Have you ever won a soul to Jesus? That's a good question, isn't it? You say, well, I'm not the preacher. No. That's not the preacher's job. Now, it's true the preacher gets the blessing of doing it pretty often and you don't know what you're missing. You have no idea the fun, the joy, the blessing, the thrill that you are missing. Ah, revival is a burst of light from the throne of God. Revival is conviction of sin. Revival is answered prayers. No, I don't mean you prayed and you, three months ago you got an answer to prayer. That's not an answer to prayer. That's the law of averages. Revival is when you have answers to prayer. When you go before God and you bring your petitions before Him and you see the answers to Him tomorrow. That's what happens in Revival. You don't have to go three months and then say, oh, God answered one of my prayers. What about the other ones you prayed? Revival is answers to prayer. Well, the Bible is full of revival. 
There are many passages that we could turn to this evening, but I've chosen to turn to Joel chapter 2, and we want to draw out of this chapter Ten Commandments for Revival. See if we can do this in an hour. <clears throat> Ten Commandments for Revival, Joel chapter 2, and we'll read verse 15 through 18, and then take a look at a few of these points. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 15 and reading, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet, let the priests the ministers of the Lord weep before the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Ten commandments for revival. The first one we'd like to look at is found in verse 1 and also in verse 15, and that is to sound the alarm. The first thing we need to do is sound the alarm or become aware of the fact that we need one. We need to become aware of the fact that we need one. And I had to think as I was pondering this point a little earlier here, I wish I had a ram's horn tonight. This would be a beautiful building to blow one in. Because that's exactly what they used. They used the ram's horn. And that ram's horn had a shrill, loud sound to it. And it shook everybody. And it brought trembling into the hearts of the people when they heard the sound of the ram horn blowing. And I wish I had one tonight that we could blow it. But we want to get the spiritual sense of what God is saying in these verses. And that is that the people need to be made aware that something is wrong. That's what sounding the alarm is all about. And today, brothers and sisters, there needs to be a trumpet blown. Because people don't realize where they're at. I don't know if there's such a thing as a Laodicean age or not. But I know there's such a thing as a Laodicean church. And that church needs to be woke up. They need to realize that they are a rich, poor church. You know, you can be a poor, rich church or you can be a rich, poor church. I wonder which one you'd like to be. All oh, the Laodiceans. They were rich and increased and in need of nothing. When in reality, God said that they were poor and naked and wretched and blind. So the first point, the first commandment for revival is, you've got to bring the people to awareness that they've got a need. That's the number one commandment. You'll never have a revival until you see a need. You'll never have a revival in your own life until you see the need. And you say, well, I don't think I have any need. How many souls did you win the last year? How many times did you spend an hour of intercessory prayer in the last year? How many times have you reached out to somebody else and had a right word, a fresh word from heaven to minister to somebody else's need? How many times, brother? How many times, sister? I think sometimes we, we're too plain. We just sit in our plainness and we live our sweet little lives and we think that everything is okay. Brothers and sisters, have you read the book of Acts lately? Did you study the Anabaptists for a while? They were on fire for God. They had a fire burning inside their hearts. They were winning souls wherever they went. They weren't building farms. They were building the kingdom of God. That's what they were doing. And I'd just like to blow the trumpet a little bit tonight. Lest we think that it's my brother or it's my sister, not me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. We need to be shaken out of our complacency tonight. We do. You know it's so. Recently heard a, a grieving report of a congregation somewhere a little ways away from here 
Wednesday night prayer meeting. Everybody gets down on their knees to pray. And you've got to wake the fellow up next to you when it's his turn to pray because he fell asleep. What kind of a prayer meeting is that? Whatever happened to an effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that moves much and that does much. Whatever happened to those? Whatever ever happened to the Acts chapter 4 prayers where they prayed and the place was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they went out with boldness and preached the Word of God. You see, it's not enough just to be the way we are. It's not enough just to be dressed right. It's not enough just to have a nice little family. And I believe in all those things. But we need to be shaken out of our own complacency. The quiet of the land is Old Testament, not New Testament. The New Testament has warriors in it. They're out there fighting the battle because there's a fire burning on the inside of them. So I just like to blow the trumpet. That's point number one. We want to have a revival. First, we need to see that we need one. That's point number one. <clears throat> and you know it's so. The souls are not saved. The souls are not saved. Judgment is right around the corner. It's right around the corner. Where was it? I guess it's a little further. At the end of Joel it says, The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. It says it again in Amos, The Lord will roar out of Zion. You know, judgment is right around the corner. And I, and I don't just mean you. I mean we. Sometimes we think we've got forever. And judgment is about to fall. And many are not saved. <clears throat> All right. So that's point number one. The first commandment for revival, and I think we would all agree with that, we got to know that we need one. That's number one. We get from there, now we go to number two. We gather the people together. Gather the people together. Verse 16, it says, gather the people. That's a very interesting little point there. You gather a bunch of people together and make them aware that they need revival and see what happens to a group of people like that. They get together and realize, hey... We're not, things aren't right. It happens all the time. We hear about them on the telephone, Brother Mose and I. Just about church split time. Three or four families in a congregation, all of a sudden they become aware. Things aren't right. These prayer meetings are dead. We haven't had a soul down an aisle in this church for five years. And three or four families will get together and start praying. They see a need. We need revival. And they begin to pray. They gather themselves together. And when you gather together a people who realize they have a need and they begin to lay that thing before God, God's going to move. He'll move. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. And if we'll realize our own need and gather together with those kind of hearts in mind, you'll see God do something this week. You will. I promise you that on the authority of the Word of God and on the authority of God Himself. Wherever there's a people who recognize their need and gather together with a broken heart and begin to sigh and cry unto God for the needs that are among them, God will begin to work. He will. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you need to gather the people together. There needs to be a group consciousness to have a revival among a people, there needs to be a group consciousness. We all need to become aware of it. Not just one or two here and one or two over here, but we all need to become aware of it. And oh, what a blessing that is when you have a group of people, when everybody in that group says, yes, Lord, we have a need, and Lord, we're going to do something about it. Oh, I'll tell you what. Jesus will build a church in that place. I promise you that. 
He'll build one. He said he'll build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he's still building his church today. He's just looking for people who are in fit condition that he can build through them. He hasn't stopped building his church. No, not one bit. He just doesn't have anybody to build it with. So, number two, commandment of revival is that a group consciousness comes over us. That we as a group, we realize we have a need. Something is wrong. <clears throat> Number three. <clears throat> Number three, you need to make revival a priority. It has to become a priority. <clears throat> Commandment number three. It must become a priority. Notice what it says in the last part of verse 16. <clears throat> Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breath. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest and the minister of the Lord. Notice what it says there. It's a priority. I mean, bridegroom, come out of your chamber. Bride, come forth. Mother with child, you come. Elders, you come. Everybody, drop what you're doing. Forget what you had in your hand. There's something important going on. The trumpet has been blown. There's a need in the land. And when revival becomes a priority like that, you watch what will happen. God will work. But well, the problem is, many times it's not a priority. Oh, we're, we're fine to have meetings. We're glad to have the meetings. Meetings are good. We'll go to the meetings. We'll go to the prayer meeting. We'll pray the prayer. That's fine. No problem. But to make revival a priority, it takes a lot more than that. It means, it means it's on your heart all day. It means while you're busy there working, you're in your kitchen, you're out there in the barn, you're working, you're out in the field putting in fence posts or whatever. There's something on inside of a heart that says, Lord, what, what? We need you, Lord. We need your blessing. We need you to work. We need you to do something among us. And when revival becomes a priority, that people are willing to lay things aside, you'll see something happen. <clears throat> revival comes when people get desperate <clears throat> and usually revival doesn't come if people are desperate I mean I, I've never seen it I've never seen revival come to a sleepy people who are just kind of sitting around going through the motions of their Christian life but to the ones who see the need and they make it a priority. God will do something. Would you like to have a revival? Think about it. You have a little child, five years old. She gets sick. You have to take her to the hospital. She's going to be in the hospital for a month. Whose priorities change? They change. We change our priorities. We do it all the time. When we get desperate about revival, we change our priorities. Much could be said about that. You know, maybe we work 45 hours instead of 60. That'd be all right. When revival becomes a priority, when we say, God, we've got to have it. We're desperate. We need you to move. There's needs all around us. 
There's needs in my own life. There's needs in our fellowship. We need you to do something, Lord. And we get like that. And our priorities start changing. You watch and see what happens. Number four. We're going to jump back up to verse 15 now and notice commandment number four. Sanctify a fast. Sanctify a fast. Fast? Yes, fast. That means going without food. That means an empty stomach. That means a quivering knee. That means weak arms. A fast. Sanctify a fast, says the Bible. What does it mean to sanctify a fast? It means to set aside a fast for this particular reason. That's what sanctify a fast means. Let's sanctify, let's set apart a fast for this particular reason and fast unto the Lord with prayer and crying and desperation that God would do something in our lives. Sanctify a fast. That is a, a lost tool in the, in the church of Jesus Christ today. That's a lost tool. Too many McDonald's and Burger Kings around to sanctify a fast in America. Too much food around. Too many nice things to eat. Too many delicious meals. Too much dessert sitting around. Too many cookies in the house. Too much nice stuff to feed our bellies on. Who can sanctify a fast today? But the Bible says, sanctify a fast. Get so concerned about what God needs to do that you'll just lay the plate aside and seek God with an empty stomach. Do you know what will happen if you'll do that? <clears throat> Empty stomach equals hungry heart. Did you know that? An empty stomach equals a broken heart. An empty stomach equals a praying heart. Try it sometime. You'll find all three of them in that empty stomach. People have no idea what they're missing. They think... They're having their nice meal. But I'll tell you what, you're missing a broken heart. You're missing a praying heart. You're missing a hungry heart who is longing after and hungering after what God can do in your life. You're missing those three things while you had your cherry pie in the mode. That's what you're missing. And God says the commandments for revival is sanctify a fast. Set aside a fast. And seek my faith for a revival. And if you want to learn what fasting is all about, read Isaiah chapter 58. This is the fast that he has chosen. <clears throat> you see, God wants us to pray specific prayers. God wants us to zero in on a specific need. And when you sanctify a fast for a specific purpose, it, it'll do something. It moves heaven. I, doesn't, I don't know how it moves heaven, but I know it moves heaven. When you sanctify a fast, like Isaiah chapter 58. <clears throat> All right, number five. <clears throat> and this is also found in verse 15. Commandment number five. Call a solemn assembly. Just like our brother Moses said about repentance. Mourning. Call a mourning assembly. Call a sad assembly. Call a poverty stricken assembly together and see what God will do. <coughs> <clears throat> James chapter 4 says draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you cleanse your hands ye sinners and purify your hearts ye double minded be afflicted and mourn and weep let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. Call a solemn assembly which 
I believe what the Bible is saying here is that everybody just gather together and be sad. Just gather together and break your hearts. Just gather together and, and mourn over the fact and, and be poor. Just be poverty stricken before the Lord. And just say, God, here we are. We're just beggars. We don't know what to do. If you don't come and do something, what else can be done? Listen, the Lord loves beggars. He loves them. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the beggars who come before me. That's what God says. He blesses the beggars. The ones that don't need anything, they don't get anything. But the beggars God loves call a solemn assembly. All right, let's move on. Commandment number six. Sanctify the congregation. <clears throat> Oh, now, now this is where it gets right down the home. Sanctify the congregation. <clears throat> In verse 16 it says, Gather the people and sanctify the congregation. But let's move up to verse 12 and so we can get an idea of what God means by that. <clears throat> verse 12 says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart. With all your heart. And with fasting. And with weeping. And with mourning. Sanctify the congregation. No more half-heartedness, but wholeheartedness. Wholeheartedness. Turn ye unto me with all your heart. That's repentance. That's what Brother Moe shared with us already. Turn unto me with all of your heart. Oh, we'll turn, but not with all of our heart. There's a little part of it that we're going to keep for ourselves. There's something that we'd like to do. We'll turn to the Lord, but not with all of our heart. But God says, turn unto me with all of your heart, and the Lord will have pity on us and heal us with all of your heart. Sanctify the congregation. Which means you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me, each one of us, clean up. Clean up. You want to have a revival? You clean up. Don't worry about him. Don't worry about her. Put all those thoughts out of your mind this week about what he needs and what she needs. Oh, I agree. If your heart is clear before the Lord and you have no need, I think it's a blessing to pray for one who is in need. But many times, revival is held back by that one who has a need but thinks they have no need and they push off their own need by thinking about their brother's need while the message is going on. So I encourage you, you, you cleanse your heart before the Lord in the way that Brother Moe said. I just so appreciate it. You say, well, I've not been what I should be in my home. Well, if you repent, everybody in your home will know it. They'll know it. If you repent, it'll last more than a week, I guarantee it. Sanctify the congregation. That's commandment number six. There'll be no revival where there is a congregation who's not willing to sanctify themselves. There will be no revival. We'll have a nice meeting. It'll be a sweet time. We'll enjoy it. But it will not last. It will not impact the community. It will not reach those that are among us who have those needs. It won't reach them. Sanctify the people. My mind goes back to some of our own experience back in our church, back in Pennsylvania. Oh, we gathered together. We're going to have revival meetings. We want to reach the community around us. Praise God. We want to reach the community. We prayed. Oh, Lord, bless us. Lord, reach out there. Go out there in the highways. Bring all the people in. When in reality, we had many needs in our own lives. And you may sit here tonight and say, Well, I don't have any. Get a glimpse of the glory of God once and see if you don't have any. But God had a different thing in mind. He went to work on us for a week. 
One week, every night, he got the plow out and plowed through our lives. And we had to stand up and say, I'm a proud man. And we had to stand up and say, I have a struggle with lust in my life. Please pray for me. And sisters stood up and said, I wrestle with my husband. I resist him. And men had to stand up and say, I'm an ogre with my wife and I'm mean to her and my, I get angry at my children. And that went on night after night after night. I mean, it got right down home. But after about a week of that, all of a sudden the community started showing up. And the altar started filling up with sinners. There's one. There's one. Oh, what joy and rejoicing in the congregation of the saints to see some of those sinners get converted. We prayed for them and prayed for them and prayed for them and never saw any conversion until we were willing to get up on our own and say, I have a need. I've got pride in my heart. I'm struggling with lust. I don't love my husband. I'm not raising my children. And when men and women got honest before God and sanctified themselves, all of a sudden, here they come. I mean, we couldn't even figure out how they got there. And here they are at the altar, wanting to get born again. Amen. Sanctify the congregation. It's not my brother, it's not my sister, it's me, oh Lord. It's me. <clears throat> Sanctify the congregation. <clears throat> Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. That's what the Bible says. Sanctify the congregation. <clears throat> Commandment number seven is found in verse 13. <clears throat> break your hearts. And I'd like us to notice that God doesn't say, let your heart be broken. He says, break your heart. That's interesting, isn't it? Sometimes we get this whole thing of sovereignty all mixed up and we sit around and wait for God to break our heart and God says, you break your heart. Rend your heart and not your garment. You see, in those days, that was an outward expression of the inward attitude of the heart. When their heart was breaking, they would rend their garments. But God was saying, I'm tired of watching you rend your garments. I want you to break your heart once. And that's one of the commandments for revival. A broken heart. And God says, you break your heart. Break it. Remember what I said? That, that revival is when God becomes a reality in an individual's life again. That's what, that's what revival is. Listen to this verse on brokenness. Isaiah 57, 15. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, that is of a contrite and a humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. Now that verse tells me that there's two places where God dwells. He dwells in eternity. He's the high and lofty one who dwells in eternity. And then there's one other place he dwells. On the broken heart. He dwells on the broken heart. Imagine that. The God, the high and lofty God who dwells in eternity also dwells on a broken heart. He's so big. He's so mighty. He's so awesome that he dwells in eternity. But he loves brokenness so much that he'll take all that bigness and awesomeness and majesty and pack it inside of a broken heart. Break your heart. That's one of the commandments for revival. 
break your heart. The other day, she's not here, so I'll use it. The other day, I had the blessed opportunity of spanking my little four-year-old. What a sweet thing that was. She had been bad, and I spanked her. And I spanked her good, and she cried, and I cried. And you know, you can always tell with a child when you got through. Because when we got all done and we went into the other room, it was time for devotions. And I sat her there on the couch with all the rest of the children. We started to sing the first song. And she couldn't get a word out of her mouth. She just broke down and started crying again. Oh, I looked at that and I thought, that's beautiful. That's brokenness. And then... I decided, well, I'm going to bring her over here and put her on my knee to give her a little comfort. And I put her on my knee, and she just broke down and started crying again. And then devotions was over, and a little bit later, I looked over at her. Her eyes met mine, and mine met her, and she just broke down and started crying again. And I thought, oh, Lord, that is brokenness. Have you ever had that kind of brokenness in your life where you just... You, you fall on your knees before your Father in heaven and you just, your heart just melts with brokenness. When God finds your heart like that, you will not be able to get away from Him. He loves a broken heart. Sometimes I think us adults need a good old spanking like that. <clears throat> I read an account of a revival that broke out in Africa. It began with a group of people, 20 of them, who were all broken up because they did not have Bible reality. Don't you think it's about time we get broken up that we don't have Bible reality? Brother, we don't! We don't have Bible reality! And they got burdened about it. They weren't a bunch of worldly people either, by the way. These were dedicated Christians, but they just started examining the facts and they, they realized we just don't have Bible reality. People are not being converted. People's lives are not being changed. The power of God is not in a mighty way in, a, in our midst. And they got all broken up over their knees. When you know it, they had a revival. <coughs> Commandment number eight. Intercession. Prayer. Spare thy people, O Lord. Spare thy people, O Lord. You want to have a revival? There's got to be prayer. And I know we've been talking about prayer. I've just been kind of touching it all through the message. But now we're going to make it a point here this evening. Because it's one of the Ten Commandments for revival is prayer. When people get right with God and they get desperate before God and they sanctify their lives before God and they get broken before God and they begin to pray and they begin to plead with God and intercede, Lord, spare thy people. You watch and see what God will do. No prayer. No revival. <clears throat> pray. Pray in the old time way. Pray the way we prayed tonight. If your prayer meeting ever loses that, then you need to get desperate about it. If it ever turns into a monotone prayer meeting, then you need to get desperate before God about it and say, Lord, there's something wrong. When people are desperate, they forget about all the these and thous and, and all the right things that they're supposed to pray. They forget whether they're praying to the Father in the name of the Son through the Holy Spirit. They forget all those things. And I believe in all of that, by the way. But sometimes it gets so dry to hear some people pray those spit-polished prayers that don't have an ounce of brokenness in them. 
and no desperation in them and no urgency in them. Those are the things that make prayers some desperation. Revival comes by prayer. I could stand up here for two hours and give you examples of revivals that came by prayer. It still comes the same way, brothers and sisters, by prayer. Commandment number nine. <clears throat> and this, this point here, I want to say, you don't have to have number nine. But it sure is a blessing if you do. You can have revival without number nine. Number nine is let the preachers get involved. Let the preachers get involved. Is that what it says? Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. Let the preachers get involved. Now, you don't have to have this one. But usually, if you don't have this one, you'll have a church split down the road not too far. But blessed are the people whose preachers believe in revival. Blessed are those people who have a preacher who believes in revival. And when they gather together for a little cottage meeting of prayer, he shows up to join in or blesses them because they're doing it and wants to know how it's going. Blessed are those people whose preachers believe in revival. But you don't have to have a preacher to have a revival. But you can pretty well count on a church split if you don't because then the preacher won't understand. If he's not in the middle of it, he won't understand what's going on. When God begins to move in the hearts of a few people, many times a church split comes. Sadly, we grieve over it when it happens. We hear about it from time to time. But it's not a good reason to not pray. <clears throat> I know people who stop their prayer meetings because the preacher's said we're okay we don't need revival <clears throat> number 10 I guess I got two messages here tonight <clears throat> number 10 the tenth commandment for revival is to get jealous over God's glory. Get jealous over God's glory. We see that so clearly here in these verses. <clears throat> the last part of verse 17. Here are the preachers crying before the porch and the altar. And they are saying, Give not thine heritage to reproach, reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say, That's the heathen. Among the people, where is their God? Number 10th commandment is to get jealous over God's glory. You know, today it is so. The heathen are saying to God's people, where's your God? Where is your God? I think it's about time we showed them where God was. You see... When God is moving in revival in the midst of God's people, the heathen never ask that question. They know where He is. They see it. They've never asked that question. The heathen's mouth shut when God is moving in the midst of His people. They don't say, where is your God? They come and say, we want to watch Him. And that's probably the greatest reason why there aren't very many conversions among us because God is not there in a powerful way moving in the midst of His people. And the heathen, they don't want to come and watch because nothing's there. Why should the heathen say, Where is your God? What a reproach to the name of the Lord. And you see, this last point has a lot to do with our motives. Oh, we want a revival because we want a crowd. 
We want a revival. We'd like a big church. We'd like a building filled full of people so that all the rest of the community can say, Hey, something's over there. Well, I like a building filled with people too, but that's the wrong motive. God's glory. See, God's name has been pulled down and it's been pulled down and it's been pulled down. And it's just the common word that the heathen would dare to say, Where is your God? want a name for yourself? No. Seek a name for God. Get jealous about God's glory. That's one of the commandments for revival. When you get jealous about God's glory and you get jealous about God's name and you realize here's the situation and the heathen they make fun of God. They use His name in vain. They'll even use His name in vain in our very midst and and they're not ashamed and, and you realize that the glory of God is not there. <clears throat> well, the results are real clear in this chapter and I guess that's another message. <clears throat> But the results are real clear. Look at verse 18. Then. We just gave you ten ifs. But now we see a then in the scriptures. If. Then. If you do this. Then. Will the Lord be jealous for his land. And pity his people. Yea the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Then the Lord will hear, and the Lord will answer, and ye shall be satisfied, and God will work, and God's name will be glorified. And we could go all the way down through this chapter and just show all the results of revival, which I wanted to do that this evening, but I just think it, it'd take another hour to look at the rest of the chapter and realize all the things that God wants to do in the hearts and the lives of God's people. It would take us another hour to look at it, but I'll just say this in closing to each one of you. God wants to use you. God wants to bless your life. God wants to pick you up and use you. God wants to win a soul through your life. God wants to fill your heart with joy and the blessing of the Lord. God wants to put His power in your life so that you young men can dream dreams and you older men can see visions so that you young men can prophesy and you handmaidens can have the anointing of the Spirit of God upon your lives. I'm not sure what you believe about all that, but it's in the Bible, and I believe it tonight. God wants to pour out His Spirit upon His people, not on His preachers, upon His people. And He's waiting for His people to get earnest enough with Him to do business with Him so that He can do it. The anointing of God's Spirit, the power of God's Spirit, it's for you, my sisters. You 15 year old, you know the Lord. God wants to pour His Spirit out upon you. You young boys who know the Lord, God wants to put a fire in your heart. Yes, your heart. He wants to completely transform the direction of your life. And revival will do that. I'll never forget the account. I, I, I remember hearing the account of a revival when the, God was moving in a powerful way in a congregation somewhere and there was a 12-year-old boy who had been converted for about a year and he got revived in that meeting and God came upon that young boy at 12 years old and he started to plead with the people in the congregation that they would get right with God. 12 years old. God wants to pour out His Spirit upon His people. 
You, my brother, he wants to pour out his spirit upon you. And you, not the preacher, enough of that stuff. We don't believe in clergy around here. Every brother is a priest of God. Every sister is a priest of God. Every one of us can walk with God. Each one can be taught of God. Each one can be anointed of God. And each one can be used by God. That's New Testament. That's Anabaptist. If I can use that term, that's a 15th century term. Can a week when you have the book of Acts, isn't it? But nevertheless, it's true. God's anointing was upon the Anabaptists and they were a mighty force for God upon the earth. And God wants to put His anointing upon each and every one of us that we also can be a mighty force in our community where we live. Would you like to have a revival that's still going on a year from now? Well, my challenge to you tonight is that you'll go for it. That you'll change your mind. That you'll change your mind about it. Let your emotions be stirred about it. And let your will be...